In our last session, we began discussing the obstacles in practice and their solution. So we will continue this time. In our last session, we discussed disease and dullness of the mind. We continue with the other obstacles. You may recall there are nine obstacles. And we have covered two of them. The third obstacle is doubt. When we start practice, there may be a lack of clarity in the practitioner. Some may be practicing because somebody told them it's good for you. Others are practicing because they have some difficulties. Many do not have a systematic practice. The practice is sometimes only at a physical level. It may be body culture, or it may be unsystematic practice. And there may be doubts or lack of belief, first of all, whether this is of any use at all. There may be a little voice saying, am I just wasting my time doing all this? Shouldn't I rather go out and enjoy myself? So that doubt always pulls you down. For those who are practicing a systematic method, they may have read a little bit from scriptures, from texts, and they may be a little bit more ambitious, wanting to explore their own, own depths, go deeper into the mind, get to know themselves, and get some glimpses into higher states of consciousness. But this is merely testimony of the scriptures, or you may heard about it from a teacher. That's also a testimony. You have no direct experience of this. And as long as you have no direct experience of this, there will be doubts. So the lack of belief in these higher states of consciousness creates doubts. Merely because we are following instructions from another teacher, from another person, we are following instructions from books, scriptures, and while all these are very useful, you've not had that inside yourself. And as long as you don't have a direct experience, there will be always some lingering doubts. So that was on doubts. The next one is carelessness and laziness. These two are very similar because the nature of the mind here is very tamasic, very heavy. And such a person then is very careless about what he does. And so very often the approach is not systematic. This leads to a haphazard method does not lead to really higher states of consciousness. It's not very productive. You don't attain much. So that careless approach, the haphazard approach, the carelessness and attitude is also an obstacle. Laziness, I think, is quite clear that if you do not do some sort of practice, if you're not willing to work on yourself and change yourself, then 
you cannot expect much result. The next one is attraction to worldly pleasures. This is a very rajasic attitude. Such a person is very external oriented and finds it very difficult to turn his consciousness and awareness inward. We can have a short look at my favorite diagram. And we see here that our consciousness is generally in the external world here. Even if we manage to go a little bit inward, we do some physical practice, then our consciousness turns to our body. With a little bit of breathing awareness, you are a little bit subtler. You've turned your consciousness a little bit further inward. Very few, however, manage to turn their awareness to their minds. That is already a challenge. Without a systematic approach and practice, that's very difficult. So, this awareness is being continuously pulled outward in this direction rather than inward in the other direction. So this attraction to the worldly objects means that the consciousness is moving outwards. The awareness is moving outwards. That's natural. And we want to turn it inward. This goes against the flow. And that is a bit of a struggle initially. This also requires practice going against the flow. So this is another obstacle. I will go through all the obstacles before I take questions. Is that okay? Then we can discuss all the obstacles together if people want to ask anything about it. The next one is inability to distinguish between right and wrong. This means you have a poor cognition or wrong cognition. You're not able to see things clearly. That means your buddhi, that part in you, which is sattvic, the inner wisdom, is not able to see through the mind and the confusion in the mind. Inability to distinguish between right and wrong, you'd wonder, what's so special about that? This is probably one of the single most important things we need to learn in yoga. It is because we are unable to distinguish between right and wrong. We, are, we become indecisive. We make mistakes. We take wrong decisions. That happens also during practice. There are lots of people who are unable to distinguish between right and wrong. You just have to think about criminals, people who are doing really terrible things. They know somewhere that what they're doing is not right, but still the buddhi is not sharp enough, not strong enough to cut through everything and say, no, stop, this is not right. Don't do it. So this inability to distinguish between right and wrong or poor cognition is a very important factor. It's a major obstacle. And this causes a lot of disturbance and distraction in the mind. Number eight is not able to attain 
glimpses of higher state of consciousness. Which means you're doing your practice. Perhaps the practice is not very systematic. Perhaps you are not very regular. Perhaps you have other obstacles like disease or dullness of the mind or doubts. Whatever the reason may be, as long as you do not attain a glimpse of that higher state of consciousness, there will be doubts. And that itself now becomes an obstacle that you have not had a clear glimpse of something which is beautiful, joyous, that attracts you, which is so nice that you say, I long to be there. I long to be in that state of joy and beauty. If that does not happen, we find ourselves repeatedly falling in the sense we do not have the motivation to go through the systematic process of meditation. The ninth obstacle is having attained something, having attained a glimpse of a higher state of awareness, you're not able to establish yourself in it. That can be very frustrating. That becomes a very big obstacle. But that comes much later. It's number nine. Initially, during the course of the journey, we have to deal with most of these other obstacles. Most of us have maybe some sort of sickness, stress, issues at a physical level, which become a big obstacle. Or there are doubts. Sometimes you feel lazy. Sometimes you just just do something, but you know yourself that you didn't do a good practice. It was carelessly done. Every now and then you begin to think, Am I wasting my time? Should I just go and enjoy my life? I'm sort of sitting here at my seat on such a lovely, wonderful day when everybody else seems to be having a good time. And I am struggling with my samskaras, watching myself in meditation and having to look at things that may not be always pleasant. So we need to go through most of these at some point of time in our journey. I'm sure that most of us have encountered these at some point of time or the other. Okay, that was about the obstacles. If you have questions, you want to share your comments, then now's the time. Yabena, right and wrong? Is that the same as cultural right or wrong? That's a very good question. Excellent question. Thank you very much. No, not necessary. Cultural right and wrong is like conditioning of the mind. You have been raised with certain ideas. For example, if you come from the Middle East, you have certain ideas regarding morality you may be have be raised uh, that you know uh, people of the opposite gender should not be together there's segregation and if you have contact close contact intimate contact then that's somehow bad wrong if you come from other parts of the world especially from the west you have a completely different concept of what is right and wrong. So, no, we are not talking about cultural right and wrong, but there are certain things that we, deep inside us, know 
this is good for me, this is not good for me. This is useful, this is not useful. This is healthy, this is not healthy. It could be something as simple as choice of food habits. You enjoy sweet things, and when you've been having a lot of sweet stuff, a part of your mind tells you, a very sweet, gentle voice tells you, you've had enough. Now it's time to stop. And when you are able to listen to that voice, hear it clearly, and follow it, then you are really able to distinguish between right and wrong. This point seven is really very important. So the question is, if buddhi tells you it's okay to do something, but it contradicts the mental conditioning, what are the ways to deal with the mental conditioning so that there are no internal conflicts? Or is that a sign that's not necessarily buddhi? Very uh, good uh, observations. These are really the kind of <laughs> questions that we deal with in our mentoring program. Our mentoring program is those students who have been with me over a long period of time. And we really talk about things in our lives and how we deal with this. And in this forum, of course, we cannot go into it in great detail. But in general, I'd say there would be conflicts where your buddhi says something is right, something is wrong, and your mental conditioning is different. Like I use the example of the gender uh, issue in the Middle East opposed to Western countries. The same might be about your attitude to uh, non-vegetarian food in a country like India, where there are a lot of vegetarians, and the ones who are eating meat have a totally different approach. So when there's a contradiction, the mental conditioning is very strong, you will have a problem. You will have a major conflict, but you need to resolve the conflict. And one of the methods for that is internal dialogue. We use that to have a dialogue between these two parts so we can resolve the conflict. There may be a certain situation where you have to fit into the cultural environment. Else you get into serious trouble. In other cases, the issue may not be that strong and you can work with this mental conditioning. Remember, mental conditioning, the words you're using, Vena, are nothing other than the identity that you have developed over years. It has developed through your upbringing, your schooling, your culture, your special family life, all these things have created a certain identity. And that combined together is Bena or Radhika or whosoever. And that is simply another word for Ahankara. So what you're talking about is a conflict between Buddhi and Ahankara. You can polish the Ankara, these conditionings or these habit patterns, so that you expand in your awareness. And every time you have a conflict with Buddhi, you will have to go through the process of a dialogue. There is no rigid approach, nor are there certain principles you can follow here, you really have to be very flexible and very alert. Because at times you may say, yes, I know Buddhi is right, but my 
cultural habit patterns are too strong or I have been raised in such and such a family, maybe some family with conservative values, and so I choose not to go against them. The focus is on the words choose, it's a choice. That means that if you do something with awareness, with choice and consciousness, it's a different from when you just follow your habit patterns blindly. You get the difference? Okay. So, yes, thank you, Vena, for that excellent question. It was a very nice discussion. Very useful. <clears throat> if there are any more questions on obstacles or thoughts about it, you can go ahead. In the meantime, I'd like to mention that we have a, a very popular YouTube channel. I think most of you know about it, but if you don't, maybe Joachim can post the link to the YouTube channel. We have over 175 videos, some clips and some longer videos some from previous sessions and others uh, are Swami Rama videos and clips and they are quite useful so if you haven't looked at it then take a look at it also we have on Facebook uh, the satsang group so maybe you can also put the link of the that for a satsang group so that you can keep in touch with the Activities, that's the events that we have, the online events, of course, as well, and all other meetings. And you can see what we are doing. Okay, so it seems that there are no other questions about obstacles. Did anybody want to add anything to obstacles? It's very important, so if not, I will continue. All right, then we continue to the next one. And the next verse is verse 31. And verse 31 says, From a big ship, the distracted mind, Emerge sorrow, dejection, restlessness of body and mind, and irregular breath. We had previously in the earlier sessions, and I think it was in the second session of the Yoga Sutras, talked about the five kinds of minds. I will briefly summarize that. The five kinds of minds are shipta. The shipta mind is very restless. Muda, a mind which is very dull and very heavy. Vikshipta, which is distracted. Ekagra, which is one-pointed. And Niroda, a mind which is really calm and tranquil. So, since we talked about the obstacles in the sutra before, the next sutra tells us that if you have a distracted mind, a mind which is not calm and tranquil, then you will suffer. There will be sorrow, dejection, there's going to be restlessness of the body and irregular breath. All these things emerge or are a result of a distracted mind. With Bena, we talked about resolving conflicts. There was a very important aspect of resolving conflicts 
Because as we keep resolving the conflicts, the conflicts between Ahankara and Buddhi, as they get resolved, as Manas, who is that part in you that is controlling the senses, becomes disciplined and starts following Buddhi, your inner wisdom, all the conflicts start resolving. As the conflicts start resolving, your mind becomes one pointed. And when you have a one pointed mind, the body is not restless, the mind is not restless, the breath becomes calm. And you are able to take clear decisions, you have a correct cognition, and you will also be able to deal with the deeper emotional states. So, <clears throat> this is how we can go from a vikshipta mind to an ekagra mind. Yoga practices or meditation, especially for those wanting to attain higher states of consciousness, wanting to expand their awareness, they can practice if they have a vikshipta mind. But for those of us having shipta and muda minds, that is those that are extremely restless or those that are very dull, they will have difficulties practicing meditation. So these two need to prepare themselves in a different way. The job of the teacher is to help in this process of preparation leading the mind to become ekagra or one-pointed. One having an ekagra mind does not really need an external teacher anymore. If the conflicts have been resolved, then the buddhi is very sharp. If the buddhi is sharp, you have found your teacher within, then you do not need an external teacher. But as long as you do not have an ekagra mind, your mind is not one-pointed, it is multi-pointed, it is restless, it's not seeing things clearly, it doesn't know the difference between right and wrong, it tends to move into the external world, all these things, then you require a teacher who will prepare you and train you until your mind is a kagra. <clears throat> so, question from Alaji. How about someone who's active in society doing social activity? Is it still a disturbance to the mind? Okay. So, where are we? We come to our favorite diagram. Where is society? Society is here outside in the world. Sorry. <laughs> That was not a very straight line. So society is here out in the world. Our awareness is generally focused here. Most of the time, this is our self-identity. And the mind, conscious mind, which is moving outwards, is the same as being attracted to worldly things. An inward moving mind is what you need for deeper meditation. This, to clarify, does not mean we should not do any good deeds or social activities. It would be much better if you stop doing the unsocial activities or the anti-social activities, but continue to do good karma, that which is useful to yourself as well as others. But you may want to take care that in the process of helping others, you don't get lost yourself. Sometimes we are not strong enough and a lot of our energy is lost then in continuously going out in the world. 
It would be a little diversion, but I think it might be a good idea to answer that question that to attain the highest state of consciousness which is here in the center of consciousness, here, this center of consciousness, to attain that height of awareness is not possible by doing good deeds, by doing welfare activities. To attain this, you need to withdraw your consciousness to this point. And that will happen only with systematic meditation and uncoloring the glaciers of the mind, removing the mental conditioning to use, to borrow Bainer's words, which is nothing other than the coloring of the mind, to remove these and listening to the voice of Buddha. So internal dialogue will also help you to a certain extent, but you need to be able to move from gross to the subtle mind, conscious mind, unconscious mind, Adiprana and finally to the deep, pure consciousness that's buried within. It's a treasure. It's not so easy to find. Okay. So what is the solution? If you have a distracted mind, what is the solution? The solution is to train your mind to focus on one tattva. I've used the word from the Yoga Sutra itself, tattva. And the reason I have done that is that it's one of the elements which does not mean uh, the elements like in fire, space, etc. But the tattvas are the stages of moving from the physical or the gross to the subtle, to the subtler, to the subtle most. So we need to begin perhaps at the most gross form, learning to focus on one of these, it could be something like training the taste. Taste is one of the elements. And you watch yourself as you get greedy and you focus on this and you begin to train your mind. You observe it. It doesn't mean that you stop yourself from eating foods, but initially just to observe it. You may find that you talk a lot, you're a very talkative person, and you train yourself by perhaps you decide to take a little time off from, from talking, keeping a few hours a day where you just keep quiet, you know, a little bit of silence, and it's nice and you feel good about it. So this is the way you start training yourself. It's always better when you have a teacher who helps you to do this systematically. But, of course, we begin step by step. So, if you are interested in going through the tatwas, the first, most gross form of tatwas are the physical objects. So, Back to our diagram. You may see that here in the external world we have physical objects that we can use to focus our attention. While these are not the best uh, because they're external, but still one can use the external objects as an aid. Which is why some people go for rituals 
you have a deity, you have an icon of some sort, and you focus your mind on that. It doesn't matter which religion it is from. You have icons even in, in other religions. It doesn't have to be a deity in the sense of some god. It could be a saint, a portrait, a photo. And that's at a physical level. Body awareness as well is at the same level. It's very gross. You can train your mind slowly to go to a subtler object of concentration and that's the breath. You can go to the next subtle level and that is the senses, like the cognitive senses, as well as the conscious mind. So in this way, you go from gross objects to subtler objects. This is an important process moving inward. So the Yoga Sutras say to begin by focusing on one tattva, one of the elements. So you have to be a bit like a river that flows over all obstacles. You may have difficulties with all these things, but you've got to keep doing them all the time. Keep doing them. Don't give up. In the earlier sessions, when we spoke about the method, we said that the method may be slow, medium, or speedy. So if you do not have a systematic method, it will be slower. That's okay. You still keep doing it. And if you have a systematic method, all the better. Then it is going to be very a speedy method. Okay. Any questions regarding this these two verses, verses thirty one and thirty two? Anything you'd like to ask about the distracted mind or the solution? Come to verses 33 to 39. These are about preparing and stabilizing the mind. So we saw that there were obstacles, and now the Yoga Sutras are talking about preparing. You don't just go to advanced practices, you need to prepare the mind. So verse 33 talks about arranging your external life. If you start practicing something, but your external life is not organized, it will create a great deal of internal disturbance. That is why we need to learn to live with, within our external environment in such a way that we do not create more obstacles for ourselves. So in verse 33, it says to stabilize the mind, cultivate friendliness towards those who are happy, feel compassion for those who are suffering, cultivate goodwill for those whom you perceive as virtuous and good, be indifferent towards those you perceive as wicked and selfish. Stabilize. I've put the Sanskrit word which is used in the Yoga Sutra itself. It's prasadhanam. Prasadhanam is actually something sweet. Prasad is something sweet. So to stabilize the mind means to attain a sweet 
state, a state of contentment or a sweet state. Um, Bena can't hear. Is that a problem for the others as well? Um, so far, um, okay. Johan can hear. Krishna can hear. So, Bena, maybe you have something happening with your own audio system. Johan, could you just write her? If she can't hear, then Johan, if you could just write to her. Maybe she's having something with her um, system. Okay. So, prasadam is that sweet state of mind where you feel friendly towards those who are happy. That doesn't seem to be too difficult to do, to be friendly towards those who are happy. Most of us can quite naturally also feel compassion for those who are suffering. We may be even able to have goodwill for those who are also good. But it's very difficult to be indifferent towards those who you perceive as wicked. So, important thing here is that these are guidelines. Guidelines so that you do not create more obstacles in your life. But these are not some rigid instructions or rules. Because rules and strategies can become like shackles. You don't, you're not free and that itself will become an obstacle. So use these ideas here to cultivate a certain behavior is useful to the extent that we do not turn it into a mask where we become fake and where we're walking around smiling and being nice but you're not being authentic you're not being natural so this is a bit of a balancing act so this is regarding your behavior in the external world. Sri Ram asks, what's the right way to deal with negative emotions like greed and jealousy? These are internal emotions. These are your own emotions and you deal with them like you deal with everything which is colored in meditation. You, you, you will try to observe it. it may, you may not work upon it. You may not succeed in that, but you try to do it. But that is the process of meditation and that will come later when we talk about klishta and aklishta in chapter 2. So regarding these guidelines so that you do not create more disturbances. Are there any questions about this? We must understand that when we start meditation so that we become happier, healthier, we are not disturbed by our own negative emotions, we first need to see that we don't add more, more problems. It's like saying, I'm somebody smoking, you know, is a chain smoker and therefore cause is getting cancer. And before you can treat the cancer, it's probably a good idea for you to stop smoking, right? Or if you were alcoholic, you're drinking too much and that's caused your liver to be damaged. Well, you have to first stop drinking before they can really treat you for, for your liver cirrhosis. So, so this is in a sense like the root of the problem sometimes is just external. And if we simply organize 
our external world a little bit, you find that a lot of your negative emotions just disappear. Okay. So for Sri Ram, the other ways you can stabilize the mind. The Yoga Sutras gives, in fact, five other ways. But remember, this is just a preparation. This is not, you're not talking about highly advanced stages. You're talking about preparing ourselves. So having had some guidelines on how to manage the external world, now five methods are suggested to stabilize the mind. So one is by exhalation and restraint. Exhalation and retention is how a lot of texts are translated, a lot of Yoga Sutras are translated. However, that gives the impression that verse 34 is talking about kumbhak, retention of breath. It is not. Because this comes again in chapter 2, towards the end of chapter 2, where again the Yoga Sutras talk about pranayama. And there we talk about kumbhak. Here, we're talking about exhalation, refining the breath, focusing on exhalation, elongating the breath, learning control, learning to control the breath, to restrain the breath, to, to master the breath. This is not pranayama, this is a breathing practice. Some of you may know the difference between breathing practices and pranayama. The difference is that pranayama is done with the mind. You use the mind. You use awareness, focus, concentration. Breathing practices are superficial, on the other hand. They just deal with the breath, and they're very superficial. So pranayama practices are much more advanced. We have a lot of people who are practicing some breathing techniques. They call it pranayama. It's become standard to do that. But from a technical perspective, breathing practices are not pranayama. They are different. Breathing practices, sorry, breathing exercises are preparation for pranayama. And here, the Yoga Sutras are talking about exhalation and mastery over the breath, learning control over the breath, which means, from a practical perspective, elongating the breath, refining the breath, making the breath very subtle, so subtle that you think it has stopped. But it hasn't, because we are not talking about Kumbhak yet. Any questions regarding verse 34? Okay, in that case, we go to the next one, which is verse 35. We are talking here on how to stabilize the mind. So five other methods have been suggested. So the second method is development of subtle sensory perception is also helpful in establishing stability of the mind. 
what is subtle or higher sensory perception? You may remember that we talked about correct cognition and we said in earlier sessions that correct cognition is of three kinds. One is the direct experience, two is inference, and three is testimony of the teachers and scriptures. Now, I think we are very clear about testimony of teachers and scriptures. It's written in the scriptures and the teacher says there's pure consciousness, it's very divine, and that's, that's something when you have attained that, you have no more suffering. So this is very clear. Inference is when you guess or you perceive something happened, like you see a shadow and you know that this has happened, you know. This person is moving because you see the shadow moving. You know the person is moving. So you have inferred. You didn't see the person moving, but you saw his shadow moving. So you can infer that he was moving. So that is inference. So you may contemplate on your the world around you. And you may say, when I was a child, I had a different body. I had different thoughts. I had maybe even different values. When I became a teenager, my body changed completely. Now that I'm an adult, I have different interests. When I grow old, I will look completely different. I can't even imagine how I will look when I'm 80 years old. But still, something remains the same. So, the Radhika, who was five years old, that something remains the same in the Radhika who was 25 years old and then the one who was 40 years old. So will also be when she is 80 years old. What is that which remained the same? So you infer from that that there's some part of me that's constant and that must be who I am. And so that is a way we infer. We can contemplate and infer from that that there is something permanent, something eternal, something deeper than what we see at the physical level, a body that's growing and then eventually aging. But that eternal, you have not seen it. When you get a glimpse of it, that's the subtle perception. When you learn to see these finer things, that will help establish the stability of the mind. For example, you listening to sounds externally. Right now, you can hear my voice. But when you close your eyes and you turn your awareness inward, you might hear sounds inward. For example, you may hear your own thoughts. That's also a form of sound or speech. And who is listening? You listen to external sounds, but you have also part in you which is listening to the internal. So these are the subtler aspects. So the development of this subtler perception is very useful in establishing the stability of the mind. Any questions regarding this? What this verse basically means is that when you are able to get these glimpses of something subtler than what we observe, subtler than the external world, something deeper. It strengthens our motivation. It strengthens our beliefs and removes the obstacles. And that's how you 
stabilize the mind. Verse 36 is contemplating, by contemplating on the radiant light of buddhi, which is free from sorrow. So how else do we become free from disturbances? We can become free from these distractions and acquire a stable mind if we can contemplate on this radiant light. Now, the translation may be like, sound like this, that you are meditating now upon some light within you. This is not what is meant. It means coming in touch with buddhi. Buddhi is not pure consciousness, but it is closest to that. It's the voice of wisdom. And this can be strengthened with internal dialogue. When you practice internal dialogue and your buddhi becomes sharper, stronger, the mind is not as disturbed or distracted because it is following the guidance of buddhi. And buddhi is so sattvic that it may sound, as you get more and more in touch with it, sounds very beautiful and it feels like a light. You may not see a light, but it, it has a certain quality that is of light because it is sattvic. It's a very sattvic, it is sattva. So the best way to strengthen this is to practice internal dialogue. Internal dialogue is a simple practice, yet very profound. It begins with just you trying to start up a conversation with your mind. A lot of children do that naturally. They talk to themselves. But because people start laughing at them, making fun of them, by the time they're six, seven years old, they stop doing it. They stop talking to themselves. Because otherwise, it's very natural for us to have this dialogue with ourselves. Remember, Internal dialogue is a dialogue and not an internal monologue. There is this awareness that you have and that is the dialogue. And as one goes deeper into this dialogue and really understands it, practices it, it's a very profound practice and very useful. And it helps us also in meditation. It is a companion. Verse 37. We can also contemplate on those who are free from the colorings of the mind. This is referring to sages, saints, great teachers who have been liberated and who have no coloring of the mind. And by contemplating upon these, you can stabilize the mind. Please remember that this does not mean that you can be enlightened. This is a form of bhakti, you can say. It's you cultivate this power, this lovely mood of devotion by contemplating on such minds. But this does not necessarily mean that you can be enlightened this way or you attain the highest this way. It becomes a preparation 
It's a good preparation, but we should not get stuck here. Free from the colorings, the Sanskrit word used is Vitaraga. Vitaraga means free from coloring. It actually means free from coloring, which means a mind where there are no kleshas, there is no attachment. Such a person is free, is liberated. So it is a useful practice, for example, in the evenings before you go to bed, to read a little bit from inspirational, spiritual books, contemplate upon saints, great teachers. But this is only one part of the practice. Remember, it is preparation. It's stabilizing the mind and we're preparing. All right. So perhaps it's best to stop here. There are two more methods mentioned. But um, verse 38 requires a little bit more explanation. And I don't want to rush through it. So we stop here today and we will continue next Friday. So thank you all. Bye-bye. Okay, bye everyone. Yes, Pena, you, you can discuss that next time.